Hi YouTube land folks, Dr. Reeves here, neurologist, sitting in the breakfast nook, not eating breakfast. This video about EEG, we'll try to keep it short. EEG, electroencephalography, brainwave testing. So an EEG is my technology colleagues, the EEG techs, glue wires, they don't really glue anymore, or they don't use paste now. And or stick wires to various locations of the brain and record brain waves. These are electrical waves. The brain gives off electromagnetic uh, waves. So anytime there's electricity and the brain runs on electricity, then it generates some waves. They're pretty small, so they have to be amplified quite a lot. And we record from lots of different places. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't change anything about the person's brain or thinking or anything like that. We can't tell what you were thinking during the EEG. I've actually gotten that question. Um, now, an EEG is one of these tests that when you're looking for seizures, and we do EEGs for reasons other than just seizures, but clearly seizure-related things is the, the bulk of why we do EEGs. Somebody, we might be looking for clues about seizures or something like that. But an EEG, in a patient who has seizures or epilepsy, when the EEG is normal, it's not really terribly helpful. It's one of, these, one of these tests where when it's normal, you're not off the hook. Now, there are two kinds of abnormalities we see on the EEG. First, we call them specific abnormalities, and the others are nonspecific abnormalities. So let's tackle these first. Nonspecific abnormalities, and there's many different flavors of this. They, they are, sort of by definition, they're not very specific. They're not linked to any particular disease or problem or something like that. So uh, we can create nonspecific EEG abnormalities or irregularities in anybody if we give them enough of certain kind of medications or something like that. So in the world of in EEG, there's normal EEGs, and then there's abnormal, and abnormal gets divided into Non-specific can be related to many different things, and specific abnormalities that are linked to seizures. So I call these, these kinds of abnormalities sort of the smoking gun. There's abnormal electrical sparking kinds of discharges which tell us with high likelihood this is a brain that is prone to having seizures. So when someone comes to me and they, I have a story from them that sounds like they might have seizures and we do an EEG and we see even between seizures you can see sometimes these sparking abnormal kind of short circuity electrical discharges then you know yeah it walks like a duck quacks like a duck okay. they have a story that sounds very much like seizures comes to me EEG is normal we're not any smarter doesn't mean just because there wasn't a smoking gun doesn't mean nobody got shot as I say there are things we can do to increase the likelihood of finding an abnormality. Do a longer EEG. Do an EEG after some sleep deprivation where it's easier to fall asleep. Certain kinds of abnormalities on the EEG only come out to play at night and it helps to fall asleep. Uh, then there's simply just doing several of them. In some cases I may do as many as two or, or even three EEGs if I'm really digging, really looking hard to try to find some evidence that would point me to seizures. Um, but at the end of the day, sometimes you have people who come in and they have things which clearly sound like seizures, and you've done an EEG or maybe even two or three, and they may be normal. Some people just don't have abnormal EEGs between seizures. Such is life. Now, there are generally speaking, two kinds of seizures or two kinds of epilepsy in the sense of where seizures begin. And I got a video elsewhere on the channel about epilepsy, the different types of epilepsy, and that's a good thing to review that. But by way of brief review, there's partial onset, meaning they start in some part or localized area of the brain, and then there's generalized onset where the electrical eruption is sort of the whole brain at the same time. The EEG is often helpful in that regard. So we're recording an EEG, and somebody who sounds like they had a, a, a convulsion last week, they're doing an EEG, and we see these generalized blips of abnormal electrical activity, highly associated with seizures. Ah, this person very likely has a primary generalized epilepsy problem. 
or if we do an EEG and, and um, in someone who sounds like they have complex partial seizures and then we see that they have uh, let's say right temporal uh, sparking kind of spike sharp electrical discharges and aha that's probably where it's coming from and that's useful information but when the EEG is normal we're not off the hook. Now there's EEG and there's EEG. There's EEG for 20 minutes, there's EEG which we routinely do for an hour in many cases, and then there's EEG that's long term. We call long term monitoring LTM and that comes in several flavors. Uh, the most kind of industrial strength flavor is the person's admitted to the hospital, they're wired up on EEG, they have a video camera watching them all the time. Well, not when they go to the bathroom, but other than that, all the time. So that we can correlate what's, what are we seeing on the EEG, what are we seeing on the camera, what the person's doing. That's very helpful. So there's inpatient long-term monitoring. Usually that's done for several days. There is what we sometimes do outpatient long-term monitoring. It's not that long. They come into the EEG lab and they spend all day. They bring a book, they bring a lunch, and they might record six, seven, or eight hours. That's very useful for people who come in having spells where we're not really quite sure what they are. Might be seizures, maybe not, and they're having 10 a day. So, okay, if we record all day, chances are pretty good that we're gonna catch something. And that'll often help us understand, is this really a seizure or is this not a seizure? What does it look like on the EEG? What's the electricity look like? What does the, the, the video look like? And then increasingly, there are technologies of ambulatory long-term monitoring. We've actually had that technology for a long time. Uh, the problem was that you couldn't see what they were doing. Well, no, that was in the era before tiny little digital cameras, like on your cell phone, that, that shoot super high resolution things. And so the technology now is evolving to where we may, in, many, in some cases, depending on what kind of equipment there is, uh, actually do long-term monitoring out of the hospital where they come in and they're wired up and then they take the equipment home. The downside of that of course is with, if a wire gun gets loose or there's some kind of technical problem, people don't know. And so the, the technology is evolving. I, I think that we will have a, a mix in the future, kind of have a mix now of people who need inpatient monitoring, people who need outpatient monitoring in the EEG lab where there's trained personnel around for a short period of time, and people who do home monitoring. In the inpatient setting, for example, if we were contemplating operating on someone's brain to uh, try to reduce seizures, we would want to record some seizures. And to do that, we might want to lower their medicines. That often would be dangerous to do and have them at home where they could go into unbroken seizures uh, with nobody there to monitor them or no medical personnel close to hand. So I think all three of these approaches play a role. The, the outpatient you know, monitoring at home is where the technology is probably evolving the fastest, I would say. So stay tuned. So that's EEG in a nutshell. Thanks for your attention.